One of my favorite topics uh, we're about to encounter, and that's consonants and vowels. So we're going to spend some time on this systematic phonics piece and hopefully providing answers to your students' questions. So as we begin, I need to know what is a vowel and what just came to mind? A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And across the nation, we can recite this like we can recite uh, the Pledge of Allegiance together. We all know this. And we know it across generations. But what's too bad is it's an incredible oversimplification. Because in English, there are 15 vowel sounds and 28 written vowels. Yet we've been taught five, maybe six. And in fact, one of the challenges with English is the fact that we have so many vowels. Some languages have five vowels. And that would be easier. But we have 15 vowel sounds to deal with. We have more vowels than many languages. So it's better, rather than, once again, rotely memorizing, it's better to learn critical thinking skills. And so what is a vowel linguistically? A vowel is a sound that can be sustained or sung. It can be made louder and softer. And your mouth is not blocked. It's, it's open. It's not blocked by your teeth, by your tongue, by your lips. In contrast, a consonant is blocked by the tongue, by the teeth, by the lips. It can't be sung. It can't be controlled for volume. Now you can do a test. You could do a scientific experiment with the phonograms you know. Four and five-year-olds enjoy doing these tests. And older students also really <laughs> enjoy discovering this. So we can test this phonogram. And we have to test all the sounds when a phonogram makes more than one sound. So how about ah? Ah, ah, ah. This is a Y. You can sing it. A, hey, hey. Vowel because. And can you feel your mouth is open? A, hey, hey. There's nothing blocking it. Ah, ha, ha. Vowel. You can sing it. Your mouth is open. How about this? B. Consonant or vowel? Why? Can't sing it. What's blocking it? Lips. Now you engage in this discussion with the student. They can discover them. Now, even when I was in graduate school learning to become an English teacher, I wondered why sometimes why? I had no idea until a few years ago. But you can test it. So the first sound is yeah, 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 yeah. Consonant or vowel? Eh, 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 eh. Ah, ha, ha. Vowel. E, he, he. Vowel. So if it's saying ya, it's a consonant. It's a, if it's saying it, I, or e, it is a vowel. Now, just to really mix you up, what is the I in onion? A consonant or a vowel? Hmm, it's a consonant because it's saying ya. Yeah. Okay. This is actually something that I would encourage you to talk about on day one. It's laid out in lesson one of essentials. And this is an example. You know, as you're teaching, you're filling in holes. Almost every adult I know, even though they're in lesson one, the words may seem kind of simple. Some of it may seem like review. Go, that is so cool. And they get excited. And the kids will, too. So as we're teaching and as we're pacing, we're wanting to fill in those gaps. Now, when we teach, and I'm just going to give you an example of scaling throughout the first week, because I think, once again, we're often in such a hurry in our culture. We see that the goal of reading camp is to get kids reading at least at a fourth grade level, right? And we have eight weeks, so we think we're going to have to sit down and give them fourth grade text on day one in order to get them reading. But I would encourage you not to. That's going to trigger shame. We already know they can't read them. We're going to have to start and fill in gaps. So the first day, you can teach A through Z, <coughs> fill in the gaps. You can teach what is a vowel, what is a consonant. And then we're going to begin to teach through a process called dictation. Now, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to move to the board a little bit and practice this with you. But we're going to, you're going to need a piece of paper. And so we're going to learn how to read by learning how to spell. And that's really backwards for most people, because we think of spelling and reading as separate topics, but they're actually the same skill in reverse. So this is what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to say a word, for example, dog. The dog ran around down the street. 
Then I'm going to ask the kids to segment the word. They're now taking those phonemic awareness skills. Go ahead. D, A, G. Now we've learned these phonograms. I'm going to ask the kids to write the word. And as they write it, I want them to sound it out. Notice as they're doing this, they are kinesthetically now experiencing the sounds coming together into a word. Go ahead and do it. And these are simple words. We'll get to harder ones. Good. Now we'll write it together. You help me write it. D, A, G. And then we could practice reading it. D, A, G, dog. Now, some kids have learned this as a sight word, but we're wanting to redraw their attention to the individual phonograms. Yes, the first day the words may seem easy, but some of the kids need to go back to this step. Let's do the word quilt. Let's sound it out together. Qua. Notice I'm going to put two fingers up here. Why do you think I'm doing that? Q always needs a U. I, U, T. Go ahead and write quilt. And sound it out. I don't hear you sounding out. You want the kids sounding it out. That's the speech um, mode of learning. When they're done, I'm going to ask them to sound it out so, and make my pen write it. Go ahead. Qua. Old. And then I'll say, hey, do you see any letters working together to make a phonogram? Which ones? Qu uh huh. And so we have qua. We're going to underline multi-letter phonograms. This says qua. And we want the kids to do it. If they are struggling with fine motor, they can do this on a whiteboard. But they're now beginning to see how sounds come together to make words. They're practicing segmenting. They're practicing blending. They're starting to see the phonograms at work. And we are just going to start simple with A through Z because they're going to know a lot of those sounds, but on day one. I promise you we won't stay there the whole time. <laughs> All right? Now, I'm going to give you more complex words later. I could give you a bunch, but I think you get the concept. We'll revisit spelling dictation in a little bit. But right now, I want to talk about fluency. So fluency is a mastery of a skill to the point of automaticity. And in specific with phonics, it's the mastery of the skill of decoding or encoding to the point of automaticity so the student doesn't need to think about each word. When you're writing or typing, you don't want to have to think about every single word. You just want it to come out automatically. Now, I think this is part of the misunderstanding about sight words. We think that if we tell kids not to sound out words, then they will become automatic. I actually disagree. <laughs> we need to teach kids to sound out words so that they do it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until it looks automatic. And so the brain has picked up the speed so it's so fast. So please don't tell kids not to sound out words. They should be. But then you need to provide more practice so that it does become automatic. And you need to provide them the whole code so they're not stumbling over all those exceptions, which we're also going to be building into in the next hour and a half or so. And the way we do this is meaningful activities. Now, so often practice looks like worksheets and it looks rote, and it looks boring. But we need to get in those 40 or 50 encounters. We need to get in the repetition so that it does become quick in ways that are meaningful. So I would suggest um, in camp that one way you can do this even with easy words is to begin to teach some grammar. Because now you're learning something that's related to these words, but you're now applying these words to something else. So the first list has things like, um, this. It has nouns and adjectives. You're going to learn that a noun is a name of a person, place, thing, or idea. They can now retake those words, practice reading them, categorize them into their parts of speech. By the way, parts of speech are incredibly helpful for developing strong writers. We don't want kids just to come out of camp reading at a fourth grade level. We want them writing at a fourth grade level. We can talk about plurals. To make a noun plural, just add the ending s. And usually when we teach rules that have lots of points to them, we're going to start with the first point. We can go through and make all these words plural and discuss what that means. We're giving them meaningful things to do with it, but now they're also repracticing the skills they have. 
We also don't need to skip reading comprehension. We are very, very fortunate on our staff to have Kimber Iverson, who has a real gift for creating readers that are controlled by phonogram and part of speech. Now, the very first one for essentials is actually very interesting. Um, this is, by the way, new. Any district that takes and uses essentials for summer reading camp can have a free copy of this as a PDF to use with their students. Um, because this is something we're in process of developing. But the very first one that goes with lesson one, it's all short vowel words, but they're all um, quips, which are little sayings. They're very hard to read accurately. You will know if your kids are decoding correctly because they have to attend to the phonograms. And they're kind of, some of them are really funny too. So very simple. And you're going to build, you're going to grow with the students as they gain the skills. Um, we do this in foundations in a totally different way, and we'll talk about that potentially later. So what is this going to look like on day one or day two of camp? You still have these three pieces that you have to put together. So weeks one and two for writing workshop, focus on handwriting. You can dictate phrases to them. So what do I mean by that? You can take words they're learning with the phonograms and rules that they've learned that week or those days, and you can dictate them. You say the, phone, you say the sentence or the phrase, they write it. Why is dictation important? Because dictation is the closest practice you can get to writing an original thought without having to think the original thought. You still have to hear it, come up with how to write it, come up with how to encode that without having to also think, what am I going to write? And now you're practicing everything except that original thought to get the automaticity because that's what these kids are lacking, correct? And you want to free them to have that so they can have their own thoughts, which they will have in writing later in the camp. You can have them writing descriptive phrases. The first two weeks, there's lots of adjectives and nouns. They can begin rearranging these into phrases. They can be cre creating lists. They can begin describing. And you're reusing the concepts they have without s taking enormous leaps, but building systematically. This is only weeks one and two. Now, you can also have them retelling orally. So composing is also about thoughts. If, even if they don't have the skills to get their thoughts on paper, you can be doing spontaneous speeches because it's the same thing, right? Minus the actual putting it on paper. And so you can be practicing organizing ideas orally the first few weeks, but let's not leave it there. And I, I, we won't, I promise. What are you going to do for inquiry and research? This is actually a harder one to meet. But I actually think this is really important during the camp. And I gave you a whole bunch of things. But first of all, I think you need to model this orally. Is this also called guided reading? I think sometimes in our middle schools we're doing this. Continue, but let's not leave it here. By the end of camp, let's bridge the gap. But read aloud to the kids. Build graphs together, make tables, identify the keywords, main ideas from texts you're reading at fourth grade level that include the state standards the first two weeks. Be modeling higher order thinking skills orally. Get them discussing, get them doing projects orally. And I would even suggest don't just leave it where you're reading, assign books on tape. Assign them to listen to things. Some of these kids are behind in their vocabulary development and in their sentence structure and in listening because they've not been reading at grade level. So begin assigning them to listen to texts. Imagine if you've assigned kids different books to listen to on a topic and then they discuss it the first week. Now they're bringing their own thoughts on a text. They're getting involved in what they could learn from texts. And you know, another teacher, Carol, where's Carol? Carol's back there. She teaches middle school and high school, and she brought up something really interesting that I think applies here. She said, you know, she has a student, and I may mistell this a little bit, I'm sorry, who was very interested in hunting and fishing and things like this. And when he came to school, he just said that none of the books there were interesting. And he felt like the teachers didn't care about his interest in the outdoors and in sportsmen's. Um, sportsmanship and things like that. And so I would encourage you, what are the kids interested in? Free them to go and listen and discover things like that. Because guess what? The hunting industry is a multi-million dollar industry. It's important. 
There's so many creative, amazing things that you can do in that industry and frame kids to love what they love and discover that books and science are all connected to what they love is really important. So go to the library during camp and help them locate some books on tape, even maybe above their grade level that might engage them and then draw out, what were you learning? What did you, and you can call this reading. Guess what, my husband listens to enormous volumes of books on tape while he's driving and all sorts of things. He always talks about, I read this book. It's okay. Like, <laughs> so let the kids begin to discover a love for books and in their interest during those first few weeks. Okay, so that's just the beginning of like week, day one or two. But then you need to begin to introduce multi-letter phonograms. We can't stop at the single letters. There's 74 phonograms. By the end of camp, they should know all 74. So let's learn a couple more. So this is k, two letter k. Two letter k. This is e. E double e always says e. Double e always says e. This is ng. And this actually has two sounds. Now we often teach it as just but what's the relationship between th and th? Voiced and unvoiced pair again. And so when we just teach th, some kids will struggle to read this because they're thinking it's this. I don't know what a this is. So when we put together again both of those sounds, we begin to fill in gaps. And th once again, just to remind you, it's a great place to tell kids, wow, you recognize that. That's really, really perceptive of you. Okay, and this is an example of some of the content that's in lesson two, possibly day two or day three. What are the single letter vowels? Go ahead and tell me. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Okay, and so we're going to look at these, and I'm going to teach it slightly differently than it's taught in the material, uh, because I want um, to be a little bit, yeah, anyway. But <laughs> okay, so what, if we read the first sounds of these, what will they say? A, e, I, A, and A. Uh. These are called the short sounds. Most of us have taught that, but did you know that the marking over it is called a breathe? And I, this is a place where you can use morphology. What does breathe mean? Short. So if something is um, an abbreviation, it is a shortened word. If you abbreviate it, if, it's, if something is uh, brevity, it's referring to short. So we can always refer to those roots when we're teaching new, vo new vocabulary. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> now let's read the letter names. A, E, I, O, and U. These are called the long sounds. And do you know what the marking over those is called? It's called a macron, mm -hmm. which it relates to macro, which means big or long, yeah, and mac macroscopic, so large. So we have these two sounds, and we're going to begin to learn about um, long and short sounds. Now, this actually doesn't just say two sounds. It says three, three sounds, a, a, and a. Ah. Does anyone know what that third sound is called? Everyone thinks it's schwa. We're going to learn about schwa later. It is not schwa. Not at all. This is called the broad sound. And there are different ways of referring to this sound. Um, and there are different markings. I chose the two dots as one of the common dictionary markings because it was the simplest <coughs> to write to use with essentials. O also has a broad sound. A, O, U. And then U is a little bit unusual. It has A, U, U and U. Uh. U uh is the broad sound. And something that we discovered just recently, do you want a little linguistics tip that's not in the book? A little preview? So what we were discovering is that broad sounds have something very unique about them. They are forward. So if you say U uh, as in put, do you feel your lips? U. Uh. It's kind of forward. U, U. And if you say aw, and if you listen to British speakers, they're very forward with their awe. 
sound. It's not like an ah uh, as in an oh, it's a aw. Uh. Very forward and round. I think there's a relationship between all of those sounds that is very interesting in how they're pronounced. Now, U has two long sounds. It says a, uh, you, oo. So what do you notice is the same between U and oo? They both say oo. But what's dropped in the U? I mean in the oo, the ya, yeah. the ya. Yeah. And that's because sometimes um, it'd be really hard to say it. So we hear it cute, but now try to say flute with the U. Flute. It's hard. So you end up dropping that ya yeah sound. And so these become both forms of the long sound where we just drop the ya. Yeah. Now, this was taught across, these vowels are taught across a couple lessons, but I wanted to condense it for you and show you. Over the first week, you're going to learn about vowels. You're going to learn things that you never knew about vowels and that your students never knew that begin to fill in holes and gaps. And then we're going to begin to teach through discovery how some of these things work. Now, with, when I teach through discovery, I like to engage the students with questions and provide support so the students cannot fail. And so this means we set up little experiments and then we get them to discover the answers. Because if you discover the answer, you're going to remember it more than if I stand up here and boring, in a boring way lecture you and tell it to you. Also, what are you learning when you are discovering answers? You're learning critical thinking skills. You're learning to look for patterns. You're learning how to analyze language. You're learning how to think efficiently about language. So we're going to do this with a very simple phonogram, um, the two-letter k phonogram. And on page 45 of your training manual, you have some words. Um, so let's all open there. And I want you to take a moment with these words and do a little bit of an experiment. Is that the right page? OK, good. I want you to underline the two-letter k in each of the words, and then as you do it, mark the vowels as short with a brief, long with a macron, or broad with two dots. Okay? And then tell me, once you're done with that, go ahead and take time to do that. What did we discover? We'll discuss it. So do you see you're doing an experiment. Your kids will do the exact same one. By the way, as they're doing this experiment, do you notice they're practicing reading CK words? And they're not doing it in rote, in a list. They are doing it with a purpose. They're doing it as a puzzle, too. Um, what are they finding? OK. So what you'll discover is two-letter k is always used where? Before a short vowel. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's always used after a short vowel. That was a trick question just to see if you caught it. Good job. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so it's always used after a short vowel. And now I can tell them the rule. And we can pull out the spelling rule card. K, two letter k is used only after a single vowel, which says it's short sound. And we can begin to um, practice that rule. Now, this solves a lot of issues with spelling, doesn't it? Because kids who learn two letter k often throw it in all over the place. They don't know when to use it. But we can then look at, well, why can't you use two letter k in the word cheek? And these words are also in their book, uh, other than bike and like, um, when they've learned the phonograms. But why can you not use it in cheek? It's a two letter vowel, and it's a long sound. How about creek, Greek? They begin to put together, why can't you use it there? Why can you use it here? They're solving those problems and understanding it. Now, in your manual, I also provided some samples on page 46 of playing games. So some kids are going to get this really quickly. It's review. Some are going to need more practice because we're all in different places. We all have different parts of our education that were filled in in different ways. These are great places if you have volunteers coming in to say, you know what, this student over here is not really understanding where to use two-letter k. And in the Essentials Teacher's Manual, these sorts of things are listed out as optional activities. So you could just go there and say to the tutor, here, go play this game with these three kids who need more practice with two-letter k. Or these two kids are not reading this correctly. Go play this game with them. But you don't have to invent it. 
but you also don't have to dwell here forever so the whole class gets stuck. You can tailor it to fill in those gaps. And then that continues to build. Each day there's a spelling list taught through dictation. We often think of spelling as this process where you give kids 10 or 15 words and they have to come back at the end of the week and spell them. And they're memorizing you know, the words by the letter names. But now we're going to begin to apply. I prefer to think of spelling as a chance to do spelling analysis or word analysis. Let's apply these rules to words. Um, also, what you'll notice about spelling uh, if you do something like this is right now it seems really popular to use spelling programs where we're going to learn all the spellings of the sound k and we're going to put them all in one list and it's going to create ultimate confusion for the kids. And we don't do that. We also don't put anything on the list they haven't been taught. And we never put all the two letter k words together. We always mix them up because we want them to now begin applying what they're learning. And we want those to come up. It's like they become free game once they've been taught explicitly. So let's just do a few words of spelling analysis using words from day two. So the first word is string. I tied a string to the kite. You're going to sound it out. St -er Mm. Notice, why did I use two fingers? Ng mm has two letters used to write it. Go ahead and write string, and as you write it, sound it out so I can hear you, so you remember to do that with your kids, too. And then help me to write it. S -t -r -i -ng. And how will we mark this word? Underline the... And here we want to emphasize sounds, not letter names. This is one of the places where you should ban letter names because when you say underline ng, you're now practicing reading that phonogram. They're hearing it again. They're getting more repetition. If they didn't get it yesterday or the day before, they're practicing them again and again in this context as well. And then if we can practice reading it, st, er, e, ng, string. All right, let's do a uh, truck. Um, the truck drove down the street, sound it out, t, er, a, uh, k. Why could I use a two-letter k here? Single and a short vowel. Go ahead and write it. Notice how I'm going to elicit, practice those rules as they're writing. And then help me write it, t, er, a, uh, k. And let's, how will we mark truck? Underline the and why did we use two letter k? It's used after a single short vowel. Do you see how we're now building? We're incorporating what we have into this word study of how do these come together to form words. In your book, you have some tips for spelling analysis. Uh, if you attend the four day training in June, you will practice this until you feel really comfortable with it. There will be a lot of individual practicum teaching and um, if you want to see me doing this, there's a lot of it on video t that's modeling it so that you can feel comfortable. But pages 49 and 50 have the steps for you. The other thing is in our materials, we have spelling lists that have enormous amounts of help for you where there is the word, there's a sample sentence. It's so silly, but I often can't even think of a sentence to use the word. I don't know why. You're all nodding, which is so encouraging. And then there's... <laughs> Examples about um, how that's marked, all of the rules for that word are listed for you. So if you don't know them very well, they're there. There's the part of speech, and there's also derivatives of that word. So you can begin to use that word in multiple ways to practice it. And our reading comprehension is going to grow. We're now going to have a poem, and we're going to explore that. Still very short on day two or day three, but we are trying to build confidence and, and fill in those gaps. So lesson three, <clears throat> possibly day three or four, we're going to introduce even more multi-letter phonograms. By the way, when we're doing phonograms, we should then be playing games. We don't just introduce them and go on. You should be spending at least 20, 30 minutes each day playing phonogram games at the beginning of these camps, because you want kids to have these down cold. And this is where 
as we talked about some of those games, they should be fun, they should be active, they should look forward to this. Some of these they know, some they won't. So let's review these. This is er, this is or, this is e, a, a. So three sounds, e, a, a. This is sh. And now we can also talk about syllables. So a lot of people have a hard time finding or hearing the syllables in a word, but a syllable is literally the rhythmic beat in words formed from the opening and closing of the mouth as, as we say vowels and consonants. So remember I said vowels are open sounds, consonants are blocked. You almost could think of it like a little drum. Your mouth opens and closes as it says vowels and consonants and that creates rhythm to language. And that's what syllables are. That's also why every syllable must have a vowel because our, vowel, our mouth has to open to say the vowel. It doesn't have to have a consonant, but it has to have a vowel. Now, I always had a hard time as a child feeling or hearing syllables. People would be like, where's the syllable break? I don't know. But a tip is your mouth opens to say vowels so you can feel it. So let's say, um, think of what's this? Garden. 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 Can you feel your mouth open twice? Two syllables. Another word. Book shelf. Two words. Bicycle. Three words. So your mouth is opening for those syllables. Great kinesthetic activity to feel them. <laughs> Another one you can do is you can vowelize or hum the syllables. Bicycle. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Isn't that cool? Elephant. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So these are tips you can give the kids to helping to hear and understand syllables. We can also clap them. This is the traditional way that we teach kids. I like clap completely out of rhythm to them <laughs> as a kid. It just didn't make sense to me. Some kids get it, but sure, keep using it. You can march to them. That's great too. All right, now we will put what we're learning about syllables to work. And we're going to do that with another spelling rule. So what is the most common reason, do you think, for a long vowel sound in English? Please don't read your manual. What do you think? <coughs> is that what you would have said? You, what do you guys think? What would have naturally came to mind? Silent final E is what most people in our culture say because that's usually the only reason we've been taught for a long vowel sound. And so that's usually what we think. And it is an important reason but it's actually not the most common. The most common is something I'm gonna have you discover if you're not familiar with it. So we will compare these. We have a bag and a bagel. Bend, B. Tot, total, hum, human. When is the vowel saying its long sound in these words? The end of the syllable. So the rule is A, E, O, U usually say their names or their long sounds at the end of the syllable. This rule is super important for kids as they go to read multi-syllable words. And then we're going to apply it. We're doing this in fast forward, so you're doing this, you know, what we would do across a couple days. But now we're going to have words in our spelling list like this. And here I'm gonna do just a couple extras to give you a feel. So the first word is paper. Take out your paper. How many syllables in pay per? Two. Two. Let's sound out the first syllable. <coughs> pay. P A. Second syllable. Per. P er. Go ahead and write it. Leave a space between the syllables. Sound it out as you write it. This will become hopefully part of your rhythm of summer reading camp that you're going to do a word analysis every day. What's, how, what's the first syllable in paper? P a. Second syllable? P er. Okay, why did the A say it's long sound? And then we can repeat the rule. A, E, O, U usually say their long sounds at the end of the syllable. And we'll mark the long sound. Now we know why. What else should we mark? Er. Underline the er. Okay, the next word is pepper. I like to put pepper on my soup. How many syllables in pep? Per. Two. Notice pep, per. Say it with me. Pep, per. Go ahead now, let's sound it out. First syllable is pep. P 
A. P. Second syllable is per. P. Er. Go ahead and write it, and as you write it, sound it out. And then help me to write it. First syllable is pep. P. A. P. Second syllable is per. P. Er. And underline the er. By the way, I was rushing, and so I didn't make you do it. This is where the kids are working. And I should be modeling that more clearly. They're segmenting the words. You're just showing them fingers. You're clarifying anything. They're driving your pencil. They're telling you what to mark. You're cueing them. You're really giving them a chance to explore why and understand and practice segmenting and blending. Um, the next word is hero. He is my hero. How many syllables in hero? Hero, two. First syllable is he. E. Second syllable is ro. Er, o. Go ahead and write it. Help me write it. First syllable is he. E. Second syllable is ro. R, o. How do we mark this one? Put a line over the E. Why did the E say it's long sound? It's at the end of the syllable. Why did the O say it's long sound? It's the end of the syllable, and we'll put a line over it. Okay? How about beak? The bird has an orange beak. Let's sound it out. B, E. Use an E, A, A. K. Use a tall K. Notice, if there was any chance of confusion, I'm telling them. This is not spelling test. This is teaching them how to spell. So, B, E. Use E, A, A. K. Use the tall K, meaning the K. Go ahead and write it. And then help me write it. B, E, K. How will we mark it? Underline the E. Why could we not use this? It's not a short vowel. It's a multi-letter vowel. We could talk about this. Two-letter k is used only after a single short vowel. All these tips are for, there for you in the teacher's guide if you want to use logic of English. If, if you just want to talk about words in these ways, that's fine too. But the goal is continue to build the linguistic complexity throughout the weeks so that you don't skip anything. And for us, uh, as, as we're doing this, if you, once again, if, if you decide to use logic of English, but this is more an example and a principle than anything, is that it doesn't take very long before you can start to read paragraphs. This is lesson three, and it's a story. And what's interesting about this particular story, the way Kimber Iverson wrote it, is that it's a story about acorns for Peter, but you don't know what Peter is. You're now going to have to infer, uh, make an inference based on all the clues as to which animal this is. And so you can now begin higher order thinking skills within a text that does not use a single linguistic element that you have not been taught. And you are developing fluency. And you're no longer feeling ashamed, and you as the teacher aren't needing to say that's an exception, we'll get to it later. You are able to experience success. So let's for a moment talk about the stages of reading comprehension, because a lot of teachers get really worried about how are we going to handle comprehension. And so I'm just going to pull back from the linguistic structure and give a few tips. So there's many levels of reading comprehension, and there's many ways to look at reading comprehension. And we'll do so in a couple different ways at different times throughout the afternoon. But one way to look at it is that as we have beginning readers, well, actually, let's back up. Do you remember those babies? They learn to speak in sounds, then in words, then in phrases, then in sentences. And we didn't expect them to speak in sentences from the beginning. With our readers, we can begin to read sounds, build those into words. Then they can play games, practicing words. Word level is also related to fluency. If you can't read the words fluently, you're going to struggle. So you can play games with this. You can do matching things. But you could also write words like spin and jump and you know, on, a, on cards, and they can draw them, and now they're reading them, and they're acting them out. You can play Simon Says. You can act out words. Then we can move to phrases. 
and you can move there very rapidly during summer reading camp where you're matching phrases to pictures. You're acting out phrases. Get the ball if you have all the phonograms and rules, whatever it is. Ring the bell. And you could play a game this way. You can have them draw pictures to match phrases. You can complete activities using phrases. And you'll notice there's nothing to do with multiple choice here. I somewhat despise those things. And I'll get back to that. You can then move to sentence level. You can use sentences to solve clues. You can act out sentences. You can complete activities. I have an activity to sentence level. You can use someone's name kicked the ball to so-and-so and they have to draw between the players what happened in the soccer game. And it's really a very linguistically simple activity, but do you notice they're using it to solve a problem. They're using it to find out what happened during the game, who had the ball when. And then we can move to paragraph level and high order thinking skills, events in order. We listed a lot of these sorts of things, main ideas, main characters, keywords, nonfiction, fiction, genres. I mean, in, inferencing, there's so many things, comparing and contrasting. But what I want you to take away is please don't jump here with texts, but do a lot of this with auditory pieces early in the camp, then bridge them over to becoming successful. Now, lesson four. By the way, you can in a camp of five hours teach one lesson a day. I have taught remedial classes in the summer, one lesson a day of essentials. Two kids these same ages, this sort of pace is completely possible and you have way more time than I did in the classes I taught. So here's a lesson four. We're not very far into camp, are we? And that's what I want you to, to grasp. Relax those first few days because it will happen. So d day four or five, you can begin to teach this rule. This is one of the only rules I teach where I just tell them. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. Let's say it together. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. But as soon as we learn it, we begin to apply it by learning phonograms. So this is A, two letter A. A, two letter A. This is A, two letter A. What is the same between A and A? They both have two letters. They both have an A. They both say A. Which one may I use to spell A at the end of the word? Why can't I use this one? English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. This is two letter A that we may not use at the end of English words. This is two letter A that we may use at the end of English words. This is OI and this is OI. Which OI may I use to spell toy? Why can't I use this one? English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. This is OI that you may not use at the end of English words. This is OI that you may use at the end of English words. This is really helpful to kids to begin to have categories to put these into. You can even then begin to sort phonograms. Which phonogram may I use at the end? Put them in a pile. Which ones may I not? They're beginning to apply it in various ways. By the way, is oi a vowel or a consonant in the word boy? Oi, 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 oi. That is the vowel. That does not fit A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, does it? So helping kids understand, this is the vowel sound. OK, do we have any questions up to this point? OK, good. I'm going to go and talk about probably your favorite subject, schwa. <laughs> Now, I'm going to warn you, schwa is sometimes one of the more, well, schwa is probably the most misunderstood sound in English. And we could even hear that today in this room. But the thing about schwa is it is the most common sound in English because of how it's produced. So let's discover what a schwa is together. First of all, what sounds can you make louder and softer? Vowels. So let's try to call for help without the vowel. Hoop, hoop. You can't. It's the vowel that lets you make it louder and softer. Okay? Schwa is a sound that we're not saying very loudly. And what I've come to do is teach schwa as the lazy vowel. And I would encourage you in summer reading camps to put up a lazy vowel chart. I mean, if you want to create a word wall, let's 
create a meaningful word wall that reinforces the rules. And one of these would be to put up a lazy vowel chart where you begin to collect lazy vowels. And I even tell the kids that the schwa sign looks lazy. It can't even sit upright. It's sitting upside down. Now, what is schwa and why is it lazy? Okay, we're going to do an experiment. And kids love this. So when you're feeling lazy, do you want to move around much? No, you just want to sit there. So if we say a, ah, and then we say the schwa sound uh, let's compare them. A, ah, uh. Which one do you not have to move much for? Uh. You don't even have to hardly open your mouth. Uh. Let's compare e to schwa. Uh. E, uh. Which one's lazy? Uh. You don't have to move. Ah. Ah, uh. Lazy. You, uh. Any vowel can sound like uh and be lazy. Anyone. That's why we don't say add uh to all the vowel sounds because all 28 written vowels would have to have uh on them. And that's not very helpful because they all say it. But why? Why are vowels sometimes lazy? There's two reasons. The first reason is syllables and the stress of syllables. And kids don't really have to know this level. I'm going to share this amount with you. Just knowing that they're lazy is usually plenty to begin with. But I want to give you the reason as to why. So in the word frozen, which syllable is accented? Frozen. Fro. And by the way, I'm putting my hand under my chin. I, don't, I do it without even thinking. Because if you want to find an accented vowel, you can feel which syllable you say louder and your mouth will drop open farther. In fact, here's another little experiment for you to do. Let's say help quietly and louder and louder and louder as a group. Tell me what your mouth does as you do it. Help, 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 help. What are you doing as you get louder? Opening it bigger. The accented syllables are the syllables you say louder. So your mouth drops, your, your mouth drops open bigger. So you can actually feel it frozen. And then we have the zen, which we're not articulating very clearly. And schwa can also sometimes sound like i, frozen, frozen. Some people say it i, i too. Say i, i. Very lazy, right? You hardly have to open it. So what we're going to do when we're spelling is, and we tell kids this, if a vowel's being lazy, I'm going to pronounce it really clearly for you. So in spelling dictation, I will say fro Zen, and they're going to hear it clearly. Here, adapt. What are we going to say? Adapt. Because the A is being lazy. It's saying it's a sound. I'm not opening my mouth very much because it's not a stressed syllable. It's not accented. That's one of the definitions. Kingdom. Oops. Kingdom. Which one is accented? King. Which one is being lazy? Dumb. You hear uh. But it, we will say to spell during spelling analysis, king dom. When a child sounds out a word like this, they will know then that they can insert a lazy sound anytime they need to to see if that's one of the sounds that makes sense. Now, most kids don't stumble over this at all, just knowing that it can say it's lazy schwa sound. What is the other reason? So there's the accent. Uh, last thing about this. The, the definition of schwa is it is an unaccented vowel. That is the linguistic definition of schwa. And by the way, lots of languages have schwa sounds. This is not unique to English. So don't feel like, oh, English is so crazy with this. This happens in lots of languages. It's just about when you don't place stress on the vowel, you're not going to say it clearly. It's going to be lazy. You're going to hardly open your mouth for it. But if we articulate it clearly for spelling, it will help. Another um, reason is that words in the sentence have various amounts of stress. And this is the whole reason I wanted to share this with you today. So when we have a sentence, the boy ran in the street, what words are really, really important? Boy ran street. Is the very important? It's a little grammatical term. You must have it to speak proper English. But if I missed the words, boy ran in the wait, street. Yeah, I didn't do that in the right spot. But you get the idea. If I missed that, it would not play with the meaning of the sentence. So these words that are not important often have schwa sounds. 
because they're not accented in the sentence. Sentences have accents too. We don't say the very loudly. So we don't open our mouths to say it. So many of those sight words that you are teaching are actually schwa words. They're lazy vowel words. And you can start collecting them. You can give them a reason. This isn't a mistake. And what happens when we get to, what do we read this as usually? The end. Do you hear it? Why did we say the end instead of the end? Because we're accenting it. We're emphasizing something. So with the, I'll teach kids to think to spell the. We even say the sometimes. And then I'll help them realize that, oh, but usually we're lazy about it and we just say the because it's not a very important word. So these, do you see how even these words that you were probably sure were going to be the exceptions or not? And this happens with was. It happens with a. So we could think to spell a cup of tea. And of is a really weird word. You can ask me about it later. <laughs> of is actually one of the true exceptions. It's one of the 2%. There is no other word in the language where, actually, I'll tell you about of, because here's how I'll teach of. I'll tell kids right away, it's a true exception. But we hear the lazy vowel. It's not an important word. But that saying v, that is the only word in the whole language where that happens. But then I also tell them this, and this is all scripted out if you buy like logic of English curriculum so you don't have to just know it off the top of your head. But we'll say, let's compare f and v. What do you notice about them? V. Voiced in, unvoiced pair. And then I'll say, I don't know, maybe we used to say a f. And it slowly changed to voice. I don't know why. You will have to remember that one. But it's actually maybe not as crazy as you might think. Do you see that? OK. And so just in summary, the schwa sound can say uh and i. And it is a lazy vowel. And it happens because English is an accented language. And syllables within words have varying amounts of stress. And words within sentences have varying amounts of stress. And so what we're going to do is we will say to spell, we'll articulate them clearly. And then this brings up a point that one of the teachers came and asked me about when it came to dialects. So what do you do about dialects? Because you have kids coming from homes speaking different dialects. You, in the South, have particular dialects. <laughs> I, in the north, have a dialect. This is what we do. I'll give you an example from the north first. There is a word that I say, probably the same as you, like this. And I say it like this. I say bean as ben. But e double e always says e. Guess what? If you drive about eight hours north of me to Canada, people say, I have been there. If you begin to listen to speakers from the UK, they say, I have been there. I say Ben. And so what I tell my students is, the reason this is spelled been is because that's how many people say it. You don't have to change your pronunciation, but for spelling, it's very, very helpful if you think to spell bean. Now, those of you who are good spellers probably just remembered it looked correct. Those auditory learners are going to remember now bean as they're writing, even if they don't necessarily say Ben, because they're going to have an auditory clue. And your kinesthetic learners are going to learn it because they're going to memorize how it's written and the feel. You've got all these different directions. Kids are going to latch on to different aspects. And do you remember what I said? For a lot of those logical little students, knowing that there is a reason is really important. And what also happens when you do this? You become aware. So when I listen to a British speaker, do I have to know when they say, I have been there, they mean Ben? Do I? I don't? Yeah, I have to interpret Ben as my Ben. They say it in Charleston. Oh, they say it in Charleston. OK. And Sounded A W. Yep. And they put it in their linguistic books and their phonics books. Mm -hmm. And they think it's strange. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we have to hear other dialects and interpret that. Well, and the same thing in print. So another one that's uh, a north-south difference that I think is interesting is um, someone is, I think you often say ten like tin. Tin. So if you're going to spell it correctly, you're going to have to say to spell ten. By the way, if you want to have your students understand someone from another dialect, say 10, they already have to know that it's 10. They don't have to change their dialect at, when they're speaking or at home, but they have to make the connection. There is a reason. So we're going to help them exaggerate those spellings. A lot of times it's towards the standard dialect. Sometimes it's towards the British, but it will help them both in comprehending other speakers and in reading and in having a reason. Okay, do you have questions about this? Yes. I have a question about the spelling rule of three, about words that don't end in U, since it's like Y-O-U. Always comes up. Um, <laughs> so what about, she's saying, uh, English words not end in I, U, V, or J. What about the words U? And I will also bring up I. Well, the word I is actually from the German ish, or ich, I don't speak German. And through time, that word is very, very old. The CH dropped off. And U also has a history like that, which I've at the moment forgotten. And what I tell kids is these words are true exceptions. They are part of the 2%. And yes, there are 2% exceptions, but that's way better than 50%. And I also tell them with these particular words, you and I are very special. So we get to end in you and I. Now, in uncovering the logic of English, which each of your schools got, after there's a rule, there is a list of all of the true exceptions. And if you find an exception that's not in the list, please email it to us and we'll add it to the next uh, edition. But you'll be able to check that there and check the reason and the explanations as well. All right, any other questions? All right, I am going to then um, show you two more words uh, as part of spelling list four. You'll notice you have some spelling lists in your training manual on page 57 and 58. I would suggest you practice dictating these with a colleague if you think you might like to use this form of word analysis. But I just want to go over two words here. And the first word is man. Uh, let's go ahead and sound it out. Mm, a. Ah. Mm. Um, and go ahead and write it. And as you write it, sound it out, just like the kids. And then help me write it. Mm, ah, mm. And we could practice reading it. Is there anything to mark? No, pretty simple. The next word is human. How many syllables in human? Okay, we are going to say to spell hu man. First syllable is hue, <sighs> you. Second syllable is man, m, a, n. Go ahead and write hue, and I'll have the kids repeat man, exaggerating it. Say it as you write it. And then help me write it. First syllable is hue, <sighs> you. Second syllable is man, m, a, n. What will we mark? You said it's long sound. Why? A, E, O, U usually say they're long sounds at the end of the syllable. Now, this has a schwa in it, right? Human. This is saying it's schwa sound. Why? What do we notice about these two words? What do you notice? They're spelled the same. This is man, this is human. They're from the same root. This is morphology. We've added this beginning of the word. Can you think of any other words where you hear the a uh, clearly with human derivatives? Humanity. Humanity. Do you hear it? Morphology begins to help us to even hear these unaccented vowels clearly because when we add the suffix, itty, uh, we end up hearing humanity. Now the accent is on it and we hear it clearly. So do you see the interplay of morphology now and the um, 
the phonograms, beginning to open up and explain the language. By the way, this is lesson four. You're probably on day four or five of reading camp. And now, if you're using the Essentials Reader, you've got a text about FootNet, which is a sport that's growing in global popularity. It's a brand new sport. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can begin to do, right? You don't even have very many of the rules and phonograms, but you can begin to expand. And the text will expand to go about um, astronauts and other STEM topics as well. OK, any questions about schwa? Schwa is a big topic, and so or dialects or rules. None. I'm glad it's crystal clear. <laughs> OK, let's discuss fluency again, coming back around. And the reason I kind of come back through some of these things is when you're growing readers, it's like a tree. You're growing deeper. You're growing all these things at one time, roots, branches. Do you see how you can begin to work on comprehension skills as they're growing? So we want to master the skill of decoding and encoding to the point of automaticity. And we have to deal with two types of fluency. And this is often not thought about, but there's fluency in reading as well as fluency in writing. We really need these kids to come out of summer reading camp to be prepped for fourth grade with both. And so as we do that, I want to help you understand the depths of learning. This was actually something that was taught to me by a piano teacher who just got this in a really profound way. And it was really helpful to me. So the first. I think, as she put it, depth of learning is multiple choice. It's the ability, if you have phonograms or words out, to choose the right one from a set of options. That's the easiest. The next thing, in terms of reading, would be able to be able to read it. And so, or I'm sorry, yeah, would be able to read it. So you're, if we're using phonograms for this, you're able to read the sounds. The most difficult depth of learning would actually be to write something without a visual um, cue. So for a student to take the knowledge and transfer it to write their own composition, that's the hardest. That's the deepest level of mastery of language. That's deeper than being able to read something. And when you're in the classroom, you need to be practicing all three levels. Practicing where there's games where you lay out phonograms, they choose the correct one. They're choosing, they're pl practicing fluency and they're, they're t selecting the correct word. <laughs> they're looking at it from a multiple choice option. Please not th fill in the bubbles. I hope you ban them during camp. Um, you also need to be doing it from the standpoint of reading. They're practicing reading these things. And the standpoint of spelling. They're writing them. If you do lots of writing, they're going to be mastering it. OK? And what are the elements of effective practice? First of all, practice is respectful. And it's looking at the student. Where are they? Are they tired? Are they bored? Are they engaged in this activity? Are they, do they, have, do they all have this mastered? Should we still be practicing it? Are there too much new content here? Are they swimming over their heads because we went too fast? We also need to think about practice from the elements of mastery and not skipping steps. This is just my kind of funny analogy to myself about it. But when kids have mastered the, the bike with training wheels, do we go, oh, you're ready? <laughs> <laughs> not in the least. But we do this with kids, right? With reading, we go, oh, you've learned A through Z. You're ready to read a real book. No. So that mastery practice and fluency practice is respectful of where they're really at. And it should be fun. These kids should be begging to come to camp because they're having so much fun with the games. It should be every day. And let me tell you, most of the districts I've talked to are doing four days a week, not five. You are going to experience loss over those three-day weekends. Expect it. Because if you don't practice every day, you lose it. And so either send things home with the kids, prep the parents, have a parent night, share with how they can practice, but some of the parents aren't going to practice. Some of the kids are going to go on vacation. And you're going to have to just be prepared. Don't shame the child like, wow, you, you act like you never saw that before. We talked about it on Thursday. They really feel like they've never saw it before. That's just how it works. We learn and we forget. 
you need to practice it repeatedly. You might think phonogram practice, the foundational skills, is just for the beginning of camp. It's for the whole camp. It's hopefully for the next school year. Uh, the best illustration I can give of this is when a colleague of mine was on an airplane, and her, uh, she sat down next to a gentleman, and she, he said, what do you do? She said, I'm a literacy trainer. He said, oh, like, ah, oh, ooh, ah, waf, off. And she was like, well, what do you do? Like, well, why do you know that? This is ah, oh, ooh, ah, waf, off. The only phonogram with six sounds, kids love it. It's usually their favorite. Um, and he said, well, I learned it in elementary school. He was in his 50s. She said, how do you still remember that? He said, how could I not? I practiced it every day for three years. And then she said, how did you have time for that? He said, oh, we did races. We could read all the phonograms in less than a minute. <laughs> so, short. <laughs> you know, at the beginning of camp, play games. Engage it so they practice a lot. But keep revisiting it constantly with short practice because this needs to be learned, mastered for life. They will pull these pieces out again and again and again when writing and reading. Practice should have variety. It should be meaningful. Please don't have them just sit there and write it over and over. That's boring. And I think we've talked about these. And so in your book, I believe you have a few ideas from some of our books. Page 58. Um, that's the wrong page. 59. Page 59. OK, you have a few ideas for practice. But you can play reading basketball, where they uh, actually spelling basketball is really fun because this is the deepest level of learning. Don't just drill spelling words. Say, OK, you're going to, I'm going to call out a word. You're going to be in teams. Someone's going to write the word. If it's spelled correctly, you get a point for your team. And then you get to crumple it up. We've got baskets. You're going to shoot it. If you get the basket, you get another point. Are your kids going to like spelling? Yeah, they're going to love it. You can do reading relays or spelling relays. Like I said before, you can set up whiteboard stations, have them in relay teams. They're going to race to write the spelling words. Um, and you can do that where there's multiple repetitions. Don't have them write it three times sitting in the same spot. Have them write it three times on three whiteboards spread across the playground. They'll love it. Do it with obstacle courses. Why not? Put an obstacle course in between them. You have to go up and down the slide on the playground, write this word, write that word. There's, you know. Use your volunteers. It can be in tremendous fun. Um, you can do phrases. Uh, one game that's in foundations is a put it on game after they're learning the broad vowel sounds like put. We have a pile of clothes, dress up clothes, and this may not be right for camp, but it's just an idea where they're now drawing a phrase of put on the coat. They have to read it, put it on. They're now practicing fluency, but they're having a blast and they don't need it. They don't even know it. There can be steps of instructions where you're now doing an experiment. They have to follow the steps. You can assign roles and read out dialogues, and they're going to act them out. These are all reading. It doesn't need to be just sitting there. I know I sound like I'm like nagging on this concept, but I really want to break it open. Um, with writing, we can also do word walls. And these are just a few examples of how to change up word walls. Word walls are really popular these days, but they're usually sight words. So what if you organize words by phonogram and spelling rule? And as you learn a spelling rule, as you learn a new phonogram, you put it up on the board. And then you begin to put words under it that are examples. Or kids begin to collect them. And they get to add to the word wall from examples they find. Now you've got a living wall that's teaching you about the linguistic structure of the language. And this is coming as a blog post. There will be a free template for this on our website very soon. So sign up for our newsletter or watch the blog because that's coming. It's all ready for when it gets put up. You can create spelling journals. One of the issues with English is that there are eight ways to spell the long A sound. That's tricky for spelling. But you can begin to categorize words. Which spelling of long A is in this word? And I can't go into it right now. But we can begin to narrow it down. And there's ways we can know which one is going to be used and which ones we have to memorize. But you can begin to create a spelling journal where when the kids have issues with spelling, they can go, 
That's the tricky sound. I can look it up by that sound. There's that word I was struggling with and then use it. And now they have a writing reference tool that's useful to them where they're not having to look up every word and they know exactly where the issues are. You could create that spelling journal on a wall. Instead of putting phonograms, that oi is meant to be the sound. And then you can be collecting. Um, I'm going to go over here and show you. So this is the sound oi. These are oi that may not be used at the end of the English words, oi that may be used. You can begin collecting words in those categories. This is z, so it's spelled z and it's spelled s, z. Begin collecting words. Just some ideas to mix up your word walls so that now you're emphasizing linguistics, you're still surrounding them by print, you're getting them involved in analyzing words, you're getting them involved in adding them. So you can also, for meaningful practice, and leverage the fact that English is a morphophonemic language. What if you have kids who keep spelling night, N-I-T-E? <coughs> Happens, right? Well, you could make them write it 50 times, hope it sticks. Or you can say, let's see, what are some compound words with night in it? What do you guys think? Midnight. Good night. Fortnight. Nightlight. Here's a list of derivatives. Wow, you're doing vocabulary development. You're writing them down. You're practicing them. You're learning how they come together. What if the student misspells clean as E double E? Because we want them to master the spelling. Because if they can spell the word, they can read it. If they can read the word, do they necessarily know how to spell it? No. Aim for mastery at the level of spelling. Spelling matters because it's a deep level of learning. It's a deep level of confidence. So they're misspelling clean with E double E. What do we do? Well, first of all, we can create what I call word sums, where they're adding prefixes or they're adding suffixes. They're now doing vocabulary development. But then we can also teach them a word like cleanse. What do you notice about cleanse? It has the E saying E, E sound. So it's got to be E, E, A. It can't be E double E always says E. Because in some of the derivatives, it says E. Eh. And when they begin to see these connections, language starts to open up. This one's really fun. I learned this just recently at a conference. But some of the phonograms have a etymology, uh, um, are related to etymology. So what is the same between a wreath, a wrench, a ring, wrestle, wrinkle, wrist, and right? What do you think? They all have the two-letter R phonogram, but what else is sa the same about them? Absolutely. She got it. Did you hear? They're all twisting motions. So everything about these have something to do with twisting, and that phonogram is only used in words related to twisting. And by the way, there are not many of them in the language that use two-letter R, even though there's some very common ones. Isn't that interesting? And then the kids, when they go to write the word right, begin to think, oh, that's twisting. And they have a reason. And it's not just rote memory. And this gets kids excited about language, too. We can go back to, as we talked about in the spelling bee, teaching etymology. All the PH words are from Greek. All the words where CH says K are from Greek. And we can begin to teach things like this. What's the problem with spaghetti, linguine, pepperoni, and scampi? They end in I. And I said something, but listen really closely. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. What language is that from? When kids see a word that ends usually in an I or U, what do they know? It's not an English word. And there's a story in Uncovering of a parent who wrote to me a letter. And she said, I taught my daughter this rule. And then we were driving down the street. And she was like six years old. And she read the word jujitsu on a sign as they were driving. And she said, Mom, that ends in you. It says jujitsu. What country is that from? Was that a good question to ask? That's a great question. They now have a question about culture. They have a question about origin. So 
Once again, knowing there is a reason is so, so important. So when it comes to writing, we need to begin with words through spelling analysis. But then we can use those words beginning on day one, not to write compositions. Please don't. Take those words, they could write them on index cards. You could say, hey, let's go out and see how many pairings of things we can make with adjectives and nouns. They can begin pairing them up. They're practicing reading them. They're writing them. You can create lists of things. You can create Venn diagrams because Venn diagrams work great with individual words. You can begin writing phrases where they write captions for pictures. So you're doing something, a project, where you're reading aloud to them they're then taking some images and writing captions to express themselves in writing, build confidence without asking too much. They can do charts. Eventually, they can move to writing texts. And hopefully, we'll have time today, but we will in June, to talk about how to find keywords. How do you use good writing practices to emphasize reading comprehension, which emphasizes great composition skills? I don't know that we're going to get to it today, but it will be in June. All right. Any questions? All right, I'm going to do a little rapid fire. Oh, no, I'm not. Grayson's ready. All right, five minutes. Five minutes break. break. Um, there'll be an evaluation and a certificate for each of you uh, down front. I'll, I'll lay it out alphabetically. Uh, please pick it up and fill out your evaluation and turn it in before you leave today.